uh, market developments. The Australian exchange traded industry continues to go from strength to strength. At the end of October, we hit over 57 billion um, across the entire industry, and we've got 248 products available. So such a wide range and a really fast growing part of the investment market. Uh, what's new from BetaShares? We've actually recently launched our F100, which is our FTSE 100 index tracker. We also launched IIND, which is an India quality ETF. A lot of interest in that one and something that we've recently launched. So um, very interesting and exciting times across the ETF industry and at BetaShares. So, very pleased to say that today we have Adam O'Connor joining us um, and he'll be taking us through the main part of the webinar. Adam's responsible for capital markets, uh, trading and execution here at BetaShares and he's also responsible for some key uh, advisor and intermediary relationships and I really feel that Adam is the best person in the business to take us through this webinar. So, welcome Adam. Thanks for having me Sarah, it's a pleasure to be involved. Excellent. Okay, so let's get right into it. Let's uh, a quick quick overview of the agenda today. We want to talk about the different types of exchange traded products. We're going to go through a little bit about the buying and selling, and then how an investor might uh, might consider using them in their portfolio. So, Adam, let's just start at the beginning. As a starting point, what is an ETP? Sure. Um, so, an, an ETP is really just an umbrella term um, for the different categories of funds or products that, that most investors would commonly refer to or be familiar with as ETFs. Um, and look, if we look at uh, you know, the term ETF as a starting point, I think for most investors that are unfamiliar with ETFs, um, I generally just say to flip it around. Um, an ETF um, it's just an investment fund that's traded on the exchange. And I think some investors, when they hear an acronym like ETF or ETP, um, for the, they can sometimes get a little hesitant because um, mm -hmm. the financial industry has uh, not it's historically been uh, quite good at creating scary acronyms. Full of acronyms. Yep, things <laughs> like uh, CDOs that played a prominent role in the GFC and uh, CFDs, which are derivatives and, and can be highly speculative. Um, and so I think it's important for um, investors that are new to ETFs, ETPs, to understand that these are not derivatives, they're funds. Um, and just like, basically just like a traditional um, managed fund, investment fund they'd be familiar with, these are an open-ended investment trust. And so from a legal standpoint, um, they're a managed investment scheme, they're governed under the same legislation as any unlisted managed fund. That means that the assets of the fund, they're ring-fenced and segregated. Um, they're held by custodian for the benefit of unit holders. And the ETF is subject to all the same uh, investor protections that, the, that a managed fund would be. The way they differ is in how your units are exchanged. Mm -hmm. With an ETP, units in the fund are traded on exchange under a stock code um, throughout the day with live pricing. With the managed fund, you obviously got to be a right to the fund manager uh, in order to exchange your units. Mm -hmm. And so this process with an ETF, um, it's also generally done by a third party market maker. Um, they act as an independent liquidity provider on the exchange and, and their business revolves around a small bid ask spread. Mm -hmm. but the other point I'd make um, is on the open-ended nature of, of the ETP. And that's what allows, that, that means that the number of units can change according to investor demand. And that's really what allows uh, an ETP or, or an ETF to trade around its nap. So unlike a listed investment company or an LIC, which has a set number of units on issue, mm -hmm. that LIC can trade at a premium or discount to its NTA, depending on you know, demand for that particular product. An ETF will, will generally always trade around its nap. Okay. So, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, this evolution and technology slide up here um, is one of my favourites and one I refer to a lot, and I think it really says, says what we're trying to say. Um, and if we distill it down to its most basic level, 
Um, what an EPP is, is it's just a progress in technology. Um, I like the, the CD to Spotify um, analogy myself. Um, what this is basically saying is, is the digitalization of music has meant we no longer need to carry around hard CDs or, or tapes or a Walkman like you would have, Sarah. <laughs> um, the digitalization of the stock exchange has meant we are we no longer need to write, to write directly to the fund manager to enter or exit a position of fund. You can just trade it on the exchange to a market that's made for you. Yeah, and I almost feel that we we might even need a, a, a next a next point, and maybe as we go through this presentation, we'll see that further evolution of the technology, the laptop, and then it's going to be something else or Absolutely. or whatever. So um, it's exciting times. Now you've spoken through um, the evolution of investment. Product. What about the evolution of ETFs themselves? Yeah, sure. So, look, as I was saying, and, and what you can probably deduce from that earlier is an ETF is, is really like a marriage between a stock and a managed fund. Mm -hmm. um, we go back to the original ETF, that was the Spider S&P 500 Trust in the US. That was designed as a means of providing the ease and access and intraday liquidity of a stock to the cost efficient diversified index fund. Mm -hmm. Now, what we've got to remember is that fund was launched in January of 93, so it's uh, nearly 30 years old. Yeah, 30 years old. And so in that time, it's pretty natural that investment managers say, hey, look, there's demand for this exchange-traded fund over the S&P 500. Well, why wouldn't we offer one over, over the NASDAQ? Um, and then why wouldn't we offer one over a sector like, you know, well, we've got the S&P ASX, 200 resources index or an energy index, and then you know, if we can hold physical stocks in this ETF structure, then why can't we hold cash or bonds or, or gold? Mm -hmm. um, and so now, from that starting point, ETFs can provide exposure to a much broader range of asset classes and strategies, um, equities, cash, bonds, currencies, commodities, um, and so on. Okay. All right, so that really just takes us through, and and you can see there the number of uh, different funds that that Beta Beta Shares has in each category. And yep. I've mentioned that we've got 55, and you know we see demand across all all spectrums of of those funds. So talk us through 1.0. Yeah. What is a passive index fund? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll just start at the top with the traditional. Index ETF. So yeah, the first ETF listed in Australia, um, just like the Spider Fund in the US, um, they're what we call a plain vanilla index tracking fund. Yeah. And what that means is they have an underlying index like the Australia 200 index, um, which is market cap weighted, and the fund replicates that index um, by holding the underlying stocks in the same proportion as they are in the index. And that's what passive management is. And because there's no active manager in, in one of these funds making subjective decisions on what stocks to hold and what weightings, you know, making sector overweights and underweights, they're generally lower cost compared to actively managed funds that may be comparable in the same asset class. Mm -hmm. um, a important feature of ETF, they're also transparent, so their holdings are available to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've got an example um, yep. of, yeah, here we go. So this is an example of our Australia 200 ETF compared to the Selective um, Australia 200 index. I can just see one line, though. Well, that's <laughs> In the site, there's one line there. Yeah, yeah so that's the point. <laughs> yeah. um, our job as a fund manager of a passive vanilla ETF is to track the index. Mm -hmm. That's what our portfolio managers do. Um, and so the index holds these stocks these weightings, our job is to hold the same stocks in the same weighting and track that index as closely as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your your investment will do what the index does, it's not going to do better, it's you know, yeah. not going to do worse, it's just going to do what the index does. Exactly, and that's yeah. what, and our job is to do that as closely as possible. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. okay. So with, um, even with so-called broad market, a uh, broad market index, there are also differences in how they're built, and, yeah. and especially overseas. So what sort of differences can investors access? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it comes down to, you know, the, the kind of stocks that are, that are in those 
um, indices. I, I think a really good example of you know different different indices for access uh, for Australian investors is something like if you were to use the Australia 200 ETF or, or index to, as your Australian equities exposure, and you wanted to use some offshore or some some US stocks in your portfolio. Something like looking to a NASDAQ 100 index, which is one of the benchmark indexes in the US, over a Standard & Poor's 500 index. You know, the way that the kind of stocks that are listed on the NASDAQ, you've got a lot of consumer stocks, you've got a lot of tech stocks, uh, you've got a lot of healthcare stocks. What you don't have is financial and materials, which we have a lot of in Australia. We've got a lot of banks, we've got yeah. a lot of miners. Yeah. And so you can use different indexes to get sector level diversification by blending them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's such a good example. Even across um, two different um, funds in the US. Yes, S&P 500 versus NASDAQ, it's, yeah. it's, it's similar. Yeah, it's pretty classic and how different it is. Um, so why would someone use an index over? Over a single stock? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is, this is a good example here, um, and I think when we look to sector and thematic ETFs, that's where this becomes particularly relevant. Um, something like our cyber security ETF, which we're using as our example here. So, say you're seeing you know, a lot of the news about you know, major hacks that are happening worldwide. Which we absolutely are. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, there's a really good one happening a couple of years ago now where the Target CEO actually lost his job over a hack into the Target network. Mm -hmm. And so you're reading all about this and you're saying, hey, look, CEOs are starting to be to become accountable mm -hmm. um, for these cyber security breaches. They're going to start paying more attention to it. They're going to start spending more money on it. You know, cyber security is going to be, you know, you start to think that cyber security is going to be a pretty, pretty meaningful uh, area of the market, yep. a growth area of the market going forward. But you don't even know any cyber security stocks. You don't have any expertise in fundamental company research. You wouldn't really know where to start. You only know that I want to get I want to get a piece of this. Um, ETFs make that easy. So with something like Hack, you get 35 cyber security stocks in one basket, one trade. Um, and you know this is also a good example of you know stock level diversification. Mm -hmm. So this chart's designed to show that that. If you're getting exposure to the sector via 35 stocks, you mitigate a lot of what we refer to as um, idiosyncratic risk, and that's stock-specific risk. Mm -hmm. So if you were to want to take a position in a particular theme and do it via one stock, and you went to, okay, I know, I've heard of Symantec, I know Norton Antivirus, I'll just yep. get exposed to cyber security that way, yep. then you're taking on a lot of stock-specific risk. And this example here shows you know, there was a, a lot of negative news around an internal audit um, mm -hmm. with Symantec. They fell 17% in one day. Now, that did have an effect on the cyber security index, but it wasn't anywhere near as pronounced as if you were holding the individual stock. Obviously, the other side of that coin is you're not using an ETF to try and hit home runs, and um, you know, it's very unlikely that you're going to pick an individual stock that goes up 10 times. Mm -hmm. But the underlying reason you would use this is to get exposure to the theme without having to go and take the risk of holding you know, just a one or two single stocks. Yeah, and and I think more maybe more importantly, when those companies are overseas or international, that is, is difficult to access anyway, um, and definitely that you know less about. Oh, we than talk, the we, we talk about the you know a lot of the advantages of ETFs, access and diversification yeah. are two of the the core, I guess, features of ETFs. Yeah, that's right. such a good example. I really like it. Okay, so uh, passive index tracking, um, very, very clear, easy to get your head around. Talk about smart beta or that 1.5 iteration yep. of, of ETF. Yes, yeah. so we put this as 1.5 because they're very much still um, passive index ETFs, but they're the next iteration of that form of ETF investing. Basically, we use it as a, as a broad term and it's used in the industry as a broad term to describe those ETFs that they're ones that don't track a traditional market cap weighted benchmark 
Um, but it's been they track indexes that have been designed to follow and consider different factors um, when selecting their investments. Mm -hmm. um, we got some just some examples um, up here. Yeah, had you know fundamental weights a really really good one. Yeah. Um, so where you've got the Australia 200 index, which is market cap weighted. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that we were, something about that. That's all right, which we referred to before. Uh, you know, market cap weights by price and uh, never rebalances. Fundamental weight based on research, slightly different. Um, it still holds the largest 200 companies, but weights those largest companies by accounting metrics rather than price, and also rebalances back to those accounting metrics metrics on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which which your market cap or price weighted indexes don't do. Um, and then you you know under this under this banner come things like factor investing. Now, factor investing is is a massive sort of growth area uh, in the ETF world, particularly here in Australia. Um, a lot of investors would be familiar with you know factor investing. It's value investing, made yeah. famous by Warren Buffett, yeah. Ben Graham. Yeah. Uh, and factor investing is basically a screening process. Uh, one factor we like um, is quality. So what quality does is when we apply it to uh, the global equities market, um, it screens for ROE, it screens for earnings stability, and it screens for debt to equity. Um, and you know, we apply that to basket level equities, we think screening the, that universe for the 150 highest quality companies can potentially provide with it better investment outcomes over time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got, lastly, you've got things like ethical investing. Okay, so sorry, and I just to jump back. So you're, you're screening uh, those companies based on the rules that yep. don't change, and you're still trying to follow an index. Yes. But you're aiming to outperform that traditional market cap. So is this where you're getting a little bit of yeah, outperformance or a little bit of kick. So the index itself is what's there. So you may have something like here we've got the MSCI World. Yeah. The MSCI World is a broad market market cap weighted index. Where yeah. you get a factor investing is factor quality. For example, is something you know a lot of active managers have used these quality screens yeah. in their own processes for a long time. Yeah. You know we put that into a systematic rules based process where we look at. ROE, we look at a company's balance sheet, we look at their profitability, that's all data that's pretty freely available. Yeah. Um, and we use that as a screening process. It's almost like taking a lot of what an active manager would have used in their process before, but not necessarily paying for that last mile. We go with like that, that last mile delivery of subjective stock selection. Okay. Um, and and this, this chart really shows the orange line is the performance of QLTY's index um, in in relation to that you know MSC World index. MSCI World. Yeah, 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 and and you can see that sort of um, difference in performance there. Yep. Yeah. So factor investing, and then you spoke about ethical. Yes. Ethical investing. So yeah, I mean you've got things like you know weighting your weighting your broad benchmarks different. You've got things like screening for factors. And then, you know, under this smart beta banner, it allows us to do things like we've done with Ethi and Fair, yeah. and applying screens based on ethical considerations to a broad equities basket, yeah. and filtering those for certain factors. So, you, I mean, this is a really good example. We start with over 6,000 stocks. We identify who the climate leaders are, mm -hmm. apply country liquidity screen, we end up with the top 100 based on those screens by market cap. Now this is still an ETF. This is still ETF 1.5 because it's passive. We're not picking stocks. Mm. We're simply following a rules-based transparent process. Um, but in terms of the evolution of ETFs, which we go back to, you know, that evolution has allowed us to put these screening process into a passive transparent fund. Yeah, and, and by following that methodology sticking to it, you can see how the um, the performance of ETHI's index versus, again, that MCI world index. Yep. Yeah, so again, there's, um, has outperformed since inception. I think that's more just saying, you know, using the screening process um, and, you know, you're not necessarily sacrificing performance to invest ethically. Yes.
yeah. But ethical investing, we know, is becoming more and more important, more and more popular, and people want to, you know, access it. So definitely another option. So the the we've covered the the sort of index tracking. Yep. Now we move to 2.0, which is where we talk about rules-based ETPs. What's that? Okay. <laughs> so we're using a few broad terms here. You know, we've got ETPs, we've got smart data. Yeah. Um, 2.0 is just you know our sort of way of describing those next phase of ETFs that aren't necessarily tracking a traditional passive index, um, but are providing access to particular investment strategies like like a managed risk or um, a buy right to generate income. So often these are means of access to strategies that were previously available only to institutional and professional investors. Um, something like a managed risk or a, an OST or a world, um, a good example of this, um, you know, WRLD and OST, they're a managed risk equity street, yeah. equ equities um, <laughs> offering. They use an institutional level risk management strategy managed by Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So they're still ETPs, but they don't sort of fall into that ETF bucket because they have that risk management strategy. Um, and, and not many retail investors or you know, people may have heard of Millinant. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And as well, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of an access thing, right? So, um, you know, things like Bear that we've got up there, the Bear Funds, uh, they use, you know, ASX uh, futures mm -hmm. to give investors access to something, to, to a means of managing and, and hedging portfolios that maybe they wouldn't have had um, but for the ETF structure. Yeah, and, and that's the, the point, right? You're always doing it in an ETF yeah, structure. Yeah, the ETF is just the structure. Yeah. But it's, a lot of these next next generation or 2.0, you know, it comes down a lot to access the things that, you know, ETF, that, that investors wouldn't have had but for the ETF structure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, go, going through those is probably, you know, potentially a good opportunity to, we're going to, naming convention. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so it's a good opportunity for us from here to, to talk to some of the naming conventions you'll see for ETF. Um, it's written up there, ASIC Information Sheet 230. Um, a quick Google search will, will find it for you. Yeah. Um, basically, that covers all of this, and I highly recommend it um, as a read for those of you wanting to understand these better, um, because you'll see when you look at our product list in particular, you'll see different naming conventions for ECS. You'll see hedge fund written beside, you'll see managed fund written beside. Um, we've even got a small number that will say synthetic and this gives you a bit of better understanding of what that actually means despite the fact they're all ETPs. Yep. They're all still unit trust. Yep. Um, and, and, sort of, and, and that as the, um, information sheet is really good. And then how does that play out when someone is looking at our product list? Or how does that play out when someone is looking at our yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, just look at the, it says it in the name, um, you know, something like the Beta Shares Australia 200 ETF. Um, it's exactly what I mentioned before. Um, yeah. Passive, market cap weighted, um, vanilla index fund. Going down to something like the Australian Equities Bear hedge fund, that has a hedge fund designation. Um, and to carry that tag, um, it means it's just a bit more of a complex strategy. Um, and if a fund is engaged in short selling, um, then it has to carry a hedge fund designation. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got, outside of the hedge fund, you have this categorization where they'll say managed fund beside them. And that broadly covers those funds that aren't necessarily permitted to use the ATF label, a lot of these 2.0 style funds. Um, but which aren't necessarily required to um, carry the hedge fund tag. And yeah. you know, this in company, things like those um, managed risk ETFs that I mentioned before, which aren't passive vanilla um, index tracking funds, but they employ a, a risk management strategy to manage the downside. Finally up here, um, you know, we've, we've got synthetic ETFs. So synthetic ETFs sometimes cop a bit of a bad rap, but a synthetic ETF is simply a fund that uses derivatives to get exposure to an index. And this will generally be the structure that's used where it's not feasible to physically hold the underlying asset. I think triple O is the example we've got up here. 
Triple O is a good example. We wanted to provide investors with you know, exposure to movements in the oil price via um, an oil index. We can't physically go out and buy barrels of oil and mm -hmm. store them as a means of getting exposure. Wouldn't think that's practical. No. <laughs> and, and it's worth noting that there are actually only three synthetic ETFs of the 248 um, listed you know, available on the exchange anyway. So there's not, not too many of those. The most recent and very fast growing, uh, gaining a lot of attention is that 3.0, the actively managed exchange traded fund. What is it? Why is that different? Yep. So active ETFs simply allow investors to access actively managed strategies on the ASX through the ETF structure. Um, basically, our approach at Vita Shares to date with, with, active, with actively managed strategies um, has been we'll consider putting an active managed strategy into the market where we feel that a passive approach might not, set, not necessarily be feasible, mm -hmm. something like uh, HPRD over the hybrids market, yep. um, or where we feel that the, the main passive benchmark has its own inefficiencies and that there are actively managed strategies that, that we think um, can add value and have demonstrated value um, over time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, like going back to, I think, you know, HBRD and, and the hybrids fund, given the nature of the hybrids market, um, it would be difficult for us to implement a, a passive strategy efficiently um, over a broad basket of hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, the hybrids market has its own inefficiencies that we believe really lend itself to, to active management. Okay. Uh, and, and active and passive, it, we've got both. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's part of being, you know, we're, we're an ETF manager. We're, we're passive and active agnostic. We just want to put, uh, you know, the best exposures in the market and give investors access to whichever particular fund they think works best for them. Okay, so how does the active management of a fund actually play out? Where, where does this start to come to light? Yes, so I, I sort of mentioned it a little bit before, but you know, where someone might use an active ETF or where that strategy, is where that strategy might offer them exposure um, that they believe is better than, say, a passive comparable. Mm -hmm. um, and again, where it gives them access to a strategy, they, they wouldn't necessarily um, be able to find in a passive equivalent. Um, RINC, uh, our, the real income fund that we've listed with Leg Mason. Beta shares Leg Mason. Beta shares Leg Mason, mm -hmm. real income fund. Yep. Yeah. So this is a really good example. Uh, a lot of investors will have listed property as a component of their asset allocation mix. Um, the, I guess the, the main benchmark or the main plain vanilla index for that kind of exposures, historically been the S&P ASX A-REIT 300 index. Mm -hmm. Now, that index tends to be highly concentrated, not only at the sector level, it's, it's just A-REIT, but at the stock level. Um, I think it's up here, your largest stock is close to 18, 20% of the index, yeah. and you've got two stocks really, really dominating that index. So that means your outcomes can be determined a lot by the outcomes of two particular stocks. When you go to the actively managed strategy, as an absolute starting point, you've got a lot better stock level diversification, mm -hmm. but where there's something like the real income fund strategy becomes interesting is grouping real assets as part of that part of your asset allocation mix and not just having to use listed A-REITs. So real income uses infrastructure, utilities, and A-REITs together. Yeah. Factors that are really driven by a lot of the you know, similar um, underlying factors um, and using those as a collective part of your asset allocation mix, which you know we think adds you know a lot of value over over what would have otherwise been just a passive vanilla index. Um, you know, then again another another example um, is where we go to the bond market. So this has been a big focus for us at Beta Shares over the past two years. And and bonds is something traditionally that uh, investors or retail investors. Have, have struggled to access. Absolutely. No, yeah. So, I mean, again, this is going back to why this has become a big focus for us. You know, we think st uh, structurally relative to other 
um, markets, Australian investors have been, you know, had had a lot less weighting in bonds for their portfolios. The yeah. data tells us that. Yes. Yeah. ETFs are, you know, they're an access vehicle to that. It's given a lot of investors access to bond products they might not have previously considered mm-hmm. um, in our listed form. But going back to, you know, why active in the bond space? One of the, you know, one of the philosophies that's driven a lot of our uh, the development in our bond uh, product suite has been has, has been around the inefficiencies of composite bond indices. So yep. if you look at the plain vanilla traditional benchmark, the Osmond Composite Index for Australian bond investing or Australian bond ETFs, um, we think there's some inherent inefficiencies in that. Mm-hmm. You know, as, without going too technical, at its core, you know that that fund or that index now is about 90% government bonds and only 10% corporate. Um, for various reasons, that's gone from being a, a balanced exposure between you know, corporate credit and government bonds to being largely a government, government. bond index. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, the ability of that to, to move over time, uh, we think is a problem. You go to something like an active solution with BNDS and you look at their strategy and their expertise in the market, this is a fund that's got a 20 year track record in unlisted form. Yeah. And when you have an active manager who has the ability to build and maintain the strategy, you know, they have the ability to not only manage the duration, but you get a much more balanced um, exposure, you know, at the underlying um, asset level. Yeah. So if you look at the asset allocation of, of that particular bond fund, you know, it's about you know, 30 to 50 percent corporate, and it's got government and it's got supranational in there. Yeah. So as a core exposure, you know, I would argue that it's a lot more balanced. And then, you know, the investment managers, there, they they can manage, you know, which part of the the curve you want to hold your government in, and which part they want to hold their credit in. Yeah, and they're actively making those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, yeah. If it's an area of the market that you're not familiar with, um, mm-hmm. it can often be a good starting point to to let an active manager um, take that, particularly yeah. in an area like bonds, where we think that the index isn't as efficient as something like an S and P 500 or uh, yeah. an Australia 200. Okay. So now that we've been through uh, the the different types, we've been through the naming conventions, we've been through the the different evolution or the iterations of, of the uh, of the funds. Uh, again, back to basics: how are we investing? How do you buy and sell them? Sure. So I mean, buy your uh, an, an advisor or a stockbroker is a good starting point. I know a lot of very good ones, but. Um, uh, for a lot of for a lot of you, it'll be via your own trading platform. So yep. whether that's your Bell Direct or your Comsec, um, CMC. Yeah. It's traded under under a stock ticker, just like a stock um, on the ASX. I mean, we can go more into probably a whole another yep. webinar itself, trading execution, but using things like limit orders, not market orders, is really crucial. Yeah. Try not to trade in the match. Um, probably as a, as a capital markets. <laughs> uh, as a capital markets representative, it's probably important for me to, to say that. To say that. We, we do actually have a lot of information on our website in the insights section, just about uh, further information on how to yeah. trade them. But, but essentially it boils down to you buy these things like you would a share. Yeah. You've, got, you've got your trading account, you've got your broker or your financial advisor. That, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, I know we do get a lot of financial advisors and, and brokers you use these um, use these webinars as educational resources. It's probably just important to highlight as well the capital markets function um, with an ETF manager, not just beta shares. You know, for you know trades of size, oftentimes we're here to help mm. with execution. Yeah. Um, so we we can act as a point of contact to make sure you get the best execution for yourself and your clients. Yeah. Okay. So how might uh, how might might someone consider using ETPs in a portfolio, sure. is it possible to build a completely diversified, you know, exposure to all asset classes portfolio using ETFs? I think with the maturity of the market as it grows, it's got to that point now. Yeah. Um, this strategy is one that, you know, we're seeing become more and more prevalent. Um, you know, it's largely defined as a core satellite strategy. And what that really is, is, you know, we're seeing people more and more use what we call low cost beta at the core of their portfolio. Yeah. So what that is is, you know, just buying the market via a low cost ETF or even a smart beta ETF. Yeah. Um, 
but having a core portfolio of ETFs across the whole asset class mix. So you can have you know, a bond, you can have your Australian bonds, global bonds, Australian equities, international equities, something like a real income to yep. cover your, your, your listed property portion. Yep. And then satellite exposures are things where, you know, you can use ETFs to, to generate um, a little bit of alpha or to try and generate alpha. Or that outperformance. Yeah, yeah, outperformance. Yep. So, yep. you know, that's where things like, you know, we'd probably usually consider hack a, a satellite exposure. Um, you know, there's some a actively active managers um, who cover, you know, different areas of the market can be considered satellite exposures. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you mentioned that we are passive, active, agnostic. Absolutely. Uh, what about blending different types of funds? Yes. So, you know, this is, you know, one strategy is to say, you know, I've got, you know, some unlisted active funds that may have performed quite well and you reasonably yep. be happy with those, but you know, they're probably grown over time. One strategy we're seeing used more and more is to look at blending ETFs, um, passive and active together. And you might find that you're able to get similar outcomes over time, but lower your all in cost dramatically. I think the number up there we've yep. you know got a um point eight six. Yeah, so you, you and that's for, you know, NDQ, something like what we've seen recently is something like quality I mentioned before uses a lot of the same screening process that some of these active managers have said they've used. Mm -hmm. You know, QLT was 35 basis point fund. Yeah. You might be paying 1.35 plus performance for an active manager who, when you actually take a look at the underlying portfolios, they are quite similar. Yeah. And so putting them together, lower your rolling cost, similar outcomes potentially. Yeah, and we and we we sort of know and we're conscious that fees matter. So, um, so what we might do is there's been a lot of questions, and I can see us quickly approaching um, the the end of our time. So let's just try and hit through some uh, some some main ones. Um, and thank you so much. Anything we don't cover, we absolutely will. Uh, take this all away and oh, um, and look yeah. to provide a, a fantastic blog wrap wrap up. Um, anyone not uh, not signed up for our insights newsletter, uh, you can do that via our website. You can also go to our website on the insights section, uh, and there's a lot of great information there as well. So uh, just, that's, do you want to pick a, one? Else? Yeah, this is a good one. I mean, just roll up through them, and I'll just yeah, they think they're good. This one just says, you know, where do I find out if an ETF is actively or passively managed? We went before the uh, naming conventions of ETFs. Um, I mentioned the um, ASIC document on that. Yep. You'll Two see things. it in the name. Um, if it's an active ETF, it'll have active um, in yep. the name. Our Australian Active Hybrids Fund, for example. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Or on our website, um, when you have a look at the fund in the full fund name, uh, the the clues will be there, either managed fund, either managed fund or, yeah. or active. Yeah. Um, if it's still, you know, if it's still confusing, you can always just reach out to your ETF provider to find out. Yep. Uh, now, what about? Whew, there's so many. Uh, oh, go up. <laughs> no, 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 down more. There was one about. A, how do you compare Australia 200 to a comparable fund? Okay, so how do I compare an ASX 200 index fund run by BetaShares versus some of the other funds run by our competitors? Yeah, I mean, pretty simple. You can, if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts, um, the index methodology of those funds are published online mm -hmm. um, on the respective websites. I mean, if we're looking at you know ASX our Australia 200 ETF versus that fund that tracks the S&P ASX 200. You know, that information is available via the index methodology. Mm -hmm. um, all the past, you know, performance of those indices is, is readily available that you can pair the two head to head. Yeah, and one, one important thing I would say to compare is that ours is 0.07%, which is the cheapest Australian broad market uh, ETF available in the world. So there's one, one way to compare. And then you can go probably from very, there. Probably a very important way to contest. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, um, 
I, I'll touch on this one. Do active, those 3.0 funds, have higher fees because they're actively managed? As a general rule, yes, they will. Yes. You know, the, the passive index funds often end up being a lot cheaper because there isn't an, an active manager making the decision. When you use an active strategy, um, where you are employing the services of an active manager to help construct the portfolio, they generally come at a higher fee. Um, but you know, oftentimes most of the actively managed ETFs, mm. so particularly the ones that, that we've got listed, um, come in you know much cheaper than some of the other um, comparables yep. in the market. Yep. We think BNDS, for example, is pretty attractively priced at say 45 bips versus you know, around around the 20 mark for a passive. Okay. Uh, so what, um, and we might just take two more quickly if that's okay. Uh, how do I find about the underlying investment? Yes, so those are posted daily on the website. Um, we have- On the provider's website the and provider. certainly our website, yeah. On the provider's website. So we're required to make um, the underlying investments for you know, passive index ETFs. Um, publicly available okay. daily. Um, I, okay. so active ETFs, um, BNDS has daily disclosure, a number of the others are quarterly in a real. Okay, and what about fees when you're trading ETFs? Yeah, so I think the fees to be aware of, uh, you know, the investor level trading ETFs, you have uh, the MER, the investment fee, yep. then the other key ones are your spreads. Um, that you pay. Yep. So you have to look at the bid off the spread and then obviously your brokerage costs and they're your key ones. Yeah. And so brokerage can be from anything from nine nine ninety nine to I think it some, all, some it people, can, whatever. It all, yeah. Yeah, it all it depends all on what your broker. broker. So they're the ones that you, they're the key ones to, to take into account. Yeah. And and it is worth noting also that there is no minimum investment in either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's no minimum investment so it can be yeah, whatever. So, um, we there are so many, so many questions, and and there's actually a lot of questions around ETF liquidity. Um, and what I might do because um, you know there's there's so many questions. I mean, we we can absolutely take it away. We can use it as our next uh, our next ETF 101 webinar. Is there anything you want to say on ETF liquidity, just quickly? Yeah, um, I mean, one thing I'd, I guess, mention just on ETF liquidity is it's important um, to understand that an ETF as liquid as its underlying. Mm -hmm. So assess an ETF um, on the liquidity of its asset, um, of its underlying assets, and not as a stock where you might look at the average daily traded volume. Okay. It's yeah. probably the key point. I mean, I, I can go into concepts like implied liquidity, but you know, we have information on that available if anyone wants to really get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, how to assess the liquidity of an ETF. Yep, and and we we write extensively on ETF liquidity. Um, if you do a quick search in our insight section on liquidity, uh, we've got quite a number of uh, articles and insights just speaking about liquidity because I know it's something that people um, often ask and, and people want to get their heads around, but I absolutely think that's a topic for our next ETF 101 series. Uh, I, I am aware we've gone over time. I really want to thank everyone for coming. It's been a huge So really, really thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Adam. And uh, right. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for joining us during our webinars this year. We've really enjoyed running them. Uh, we welcome your feedback. Please let us know if there's anything you'd like to like to hear from us on, anything that we can improve. Um, we will be coming back in 2020 with a whole whole list of um, whole range of, of new webinars, new topics to cover, and really um, making them bigger and better. So we look forward to hosting you in 2020. Thank you very much. See you later.